Hey there, you're about to view part two of the Pharaoh's paper number eight. And this goes a bit, uh, far more into the uh, possibility of uh, Alexander Hamilton realizing the police state a lot earlier than we thought. Enjoy. If you don't have time to watch these videos, or you simply prefer podcasts for whenever you're driving, running, or whatever activity you happen to be going through, you can always visit this link below to go ahead and listen to them at your leisure. So go ahead and then click the link below and enjoy. Make sure you go ahead and hit that like button for me. Hamilton then points out that there's a tremendous difference between military establishments in a country that hardly has any experience with internal inv invasions and one that is constantly used to them and is always concerned about them. Now one example to consider is the United States pre-World War II. We always retained a uh, peaceful, neutral situation with regards to every other nation on Earth. We were incredibly prosperous commercially, but we didn't maintain any kind of uh, war wartime positioning. We didn't have a lot of um, large, we didn't have any divisions, we did not have a very large military to speak of. We were at a disadvantage to the much more warlike nations that were out there. In fact, it took us a, a little bit of time to begin to restructure ourselves from a peaceful, highly economically prosperous situation to a much more warlike focus. And I'll actually uh, provide some uh, a link down below reinforcing the proof of this. And he further continues that should the rulers of the former type of states or governments so desire, the former being one that, uh, be, the former being a government that is not used to internal invasions, that they can maintain foot armies so numerous that they must by necessity be maintained by a government of the latter, meaning one that is continuously used to warfare. Such armies, in the first case, almost never being used. That the citizenry would have no fear of being broken in subordination to the military. In the first case, the law would not be accustomed to being worked in subordination in favor to military needs. The civil state not being in danger of corruption with the principles or propensities of the latter state. If you wish to know more about this topic, please ensure to look below at the description box for a link to the book of the Federalist Papers, which is provided by the Institute for Principal Studies, which is an amazing organization which provides resources relating to economics and the role of government from a biblical perspective. He further points out that the smallness of the army in proportion to the community makes the community an overmatch for the army, to quote Hamilton, and the citizens not habituated to look up to the military power for protection or to submit to its oppressions neither love nor fear the soldiery. They view them with a spirit of jealous acquiescence in a necessary evil and stand ready to resist the power which they suppose may be exerted to the prejudice of their rights. Hamilton also points out that such an army would be useful to aid the magistrate, similar to how our National Guard is used nowadays to suppress a small faction, the occasional mob, or even an insurrection. However, he points out that such an army would be incapable of providing adequate resistance or suppression to a unified citizenry. What he states is such an army would not be able to force encroachments. In contrary to this, the latter country that's being described, they would always be ready to suppress or repel the people given perpetual menacings by the people with numerous large armies for defense. Their continual need for use enhances the importance of the soldier and degrades the citizenry by proportion. Hamilton further notes, the military states become elevated above the civil. He further points out that the inhabitants of their respective territories, the theaters of war, what he calls them, would be subject to frequent infringements upon their rights, weakening their sense of those rights. He alludes to the fact that by degrees the people are placed in a position to consider the soldier not only as a protector, but also as a superior, 
and this brings to my mind the many flashpoints in the, in the United States of racial tension throughout the nation now. Those flashpoints are typically uh, issues between the citizenry and local law enforcement. But if you consider it, there's very minimal difference in terms of how the army, as Hamilton is discussing it, is being utilized and the law enforcement as we see it to, uh, to today with infringements upon the rights of the people and their, the lack of knowledge of the people of their own rights and be able to assert them to be able to reinforce their own self-protection. A lot of people seem to put too much emphasis on relying on law enforcement for their own protection instead of relying on it for themselves with law enforcement only providing for an enhancement of those protections to aid the magistrate instead of simply being their uh, their arm, their primary arm. Now, I'm not saying who's at fault in any of those circumstances, but if the people feel instantly infringed upon with their own rights, one tends to wonder how free they think that they are within their own communities. Hamilton also considers, given this distinction, that it is not a remote or even difficult possibility for even the identity of a superior, of a supposed superior, to be transposed with that of an identity of a master on the part of the soldier. However, he also states within the papers that it is very difficult for the citizenry under such a mindset to offer any real effectual resistance or usurpation to the power of the military under such a government. He considers the King of Great Britain at the time to be a prime example of the first form of government which he was discussing, the one where the citizenry has primary power and a local internal army has almost nothing other than the fact of reinforcing the power of the magistrate with a very insular condition meaning cushioned from external invasion and not a whole lot of need for a standing army to combat internal invasions having that kind of a condition and an extremely powerful navy guarding quite effectively against the possibility of a, an invasion from the outside and all of this superseding any need for a large army within the nation and even at that time all that was considered required was a militia proportional and strong enough to be uh, needed to be called up to repel any such invasion should it occur yet there was no reason to enact such a policy nor would their domestic opinion have allowed the existence of such a massive internal army. Hamilton also considers that for a long time there has been no reason whatsoever warranting any internal warfare and that that situation perpetuated continual internal happiness which even at that point this uh, the nation of Great Britain continued to enjoy in spite of prevalent bribery and corruption of the local officials. Now, contrary to this concept, if Britain was actually a kingdom within continental Europe, such as surrounded by, say, Germany, France, Austria, what have you, she would have had to change her military stance to be equal to that of her neighbors, and would, in all likelihood, be, up until the date in which she's speaking of in this paper, be under the dominion of a singular individual. Whereas, I mean, right now, yes, they do have their own monarchy, but strictly speaking, they have their House of Commons, House of Lords, and the people had, ever since Magna Carta, a um, much, much more of, a, of an increased say over their own governance, whereas the monarch was primarily more of a figurehead and the people basically governing themselves. And also we need to consider, you need to go ahead and continue to smash that like button so that we can continue to up the YouTube algorithm. Hamilton notices that it is possible, although not probable, for the people of that kingdom to be enslaved by other causes, but not by an inconsiderable force of an army kept within their borders at, at that given time. Now, Hamilton also considers that if the leaders of the Union of States were wise enough, they too would be able to maintain that kind of an insular condition which Great Britain enjoys. He points out that Europe was too far from us, that their colonies were too disproportionate to us with regards to they were too weaker in proportion to us to be of any real threat. Also that any kind of extensive fortification wouldn't be necessary to maintain our security, but that should we disunite 
as a nation into various states and or confederacies that they would be integral to the security of those various states or confederacies. And he points out that should this kind of disunity occur, we would be very much like the powers over in Europe at the time, and at a state of continual apprehension of perpetual warfare, with our liberties being in continual hostility to the needs of war amongst each other. Now, in the paper, Hamilton conceded that the gravity of that kind of an idea heavily weighed upon him, stating that this idea required the most serious thoughts of every prudent man of every party. You know, quoting him, If such men will make a firm and solemn pause, meditate dispassionately on the importance of this interesting idea, if they will contemplate it in all its attitudes and trace it to all its consequences, they will not hesitate to part with the trivial, with the trivial objections to a constitution, the rejection of which would in all prob probability put a final period to the Union. Hamilton finally observes that the flighty concerns of the various critics of the Constitution would quickly give way to the more substantial, dangerous, and specific concerns. Well, that's Federal's paper number eight. I hope you were able to get some real interesting cons uh, ideas out of what Hamilton was trying to convey to the people of New York, and uh, I'll talk to you later. Have a good day. God bless. Below is a link to the Tom Woods Liberty Classroom where you can learn more about free market economics, which is espoused by such amazing scholars as Milton Friedman and Murray Rothbard. Thank you for joining me. Make sure you remember to like the video, subscribe, and comment.